Hey everybody, and welcome to episode one of my Activator's Guide. <clears throat> so today we're going to talk about radios. Uh, this FTDX10 here on my desk is my, my shack radio. Um, we'll talk a little bit about radios like this. The primary focus won't be on radios like this, but you absolutely could use something like this. However, before I talk about radios, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the programs that we're going to be involved with. So um, I'm going to switch over to my computer screen and we'll be back in just a minute. All right, so before we take a look at the radios, let's take a look at the two programs that we're primarily going to be focused on in this series. Now there are others, um, but these are probably the two most widely participated in and they'll be the focus of this series. Pretty much everything we talk about will apply universally to all of those other programs. Uh, there are some caveats to that, but generally speaking, what we talk about here is going to apply across the board. So first, let's take a look at Parks on the Air. So this is the Parks on the Air website, uh, and this is not the website you're going to go to to log activations, post spots, things like that. This is just sort of a general overview of the Parks on the Air program. Uh, on the main page here, it just gives us a description, and then there are some uh, drop downs for different volunteers and things like that, program administrators, mapping representatives, so on and so forth. There's contact information down here at the bottom. At the, across the top, we've got some, uh, some menu functions. We have the map of entities. Now, we're not going to look at the map today. We'll look at that in a later episode when we talk about choosing a spot to activate. There's a help in getting started guide. Uh, there's a link to sign up for Parks in the Air, so if you're not already signed up, you can click that link and sign up. I'm not going to do that since I already have an account. And there is a Rules, FAQs, and Guides section. We'll go ahead and we'll click that. So on this page, it's going to give you a general overview on how to get started with Parks on the Air. Uh, there's some basic information both for hunters as well as activators. All right, um, there's a short Getting Started video here at the bottom. Over here on the left side of the page, you'll see we've got an index, so we've got rules. Pretty straightforward. I would recommend you read through the rules so you know the rules of the program and the code of conduct as well. Uh, there's an activator reference, and now this is something you'll probably want to familiarize yourself with. Uh, this goes through submitting logs. There's an activator guide, your station footprint, club activations, park to parks, logging made easy, uh, ADA files for POTA, uh, and then logging with uh, N3FJP, which is a logging program. I'm going to talk about logging programs later in the series. Uh, but all of those things are the activator reference. There's also a hunter guide. There is a, a CW guide. There's a digital modes guide, award events, video resources, support, other resources, documents, a glossary, the private privacy policy, and about. So I would probably take a look at like the activator reference. If you're going to operate CW or digital, it might be a good idea to look in there as well. Now, we've got our login tab. Again, we don't need to do that right now. We have our awards. There are all sorts of different awards that you can earn through Parks on the Air. Um, I'm not going to scroll through this whole list, but there's a pile of them. So like, for instance... Uh, the Bronze Activator Award. Work from 10 references, so 10 different parks. You get your Bronze Activator, so on and so forth. There's Hunter and Activator Awards. There's DX Awards. There's all sorts of Advanced Awards. Like I said, there's a pile of them. So this is my Parks on the Air profile. Uh, so up here you've got my statistics. And then if we scroll down, you'll see all the different awards that I've earned. All right, so you can earn awards as you progress. At the bottom, you'll see my recent activations and my recent Hunter QSOs. All right. Uh, the POTA scheduler and the POTA spots page, we're not going to talk about those today. Those live on POTA.app. That's the site you're going to use to actually do your logging, your spotting, things like that. They do have a shop where you can buy some things, and there's a Contact Us page as well. Um, like I said, the map of entities, we'll talk about that one later. So, Summit's on the air. Uh, website's a little bit different, but it's the same idea. So there's a little blurb that talks about summits on the air and what it is. It shows you the latest spots over here on the right-hand side. And if we click the Joining In tab, uh, it gives us an introduction to chasing, an introduction to activating, different awards, the general rules, an environmental statement, acceptable use policy, guidelines, soda leaflets. I'm going to talk later when we talk about preparing to activate 
about having some form of documentation with you because people are probably going to stop you and ask you questions. So I actually have, like when I do POTA activations, I have uh, these trifold POTA leaflets that I'll give people if they have questions and it kind of explains what I'm doing. Uh, there are a few other things, frequently asked questions, summit restrictions, things like that in here. So if we go into the guide to activating, all right, it's going to give you kind of an introduction, the different awards. Summits are, are given point values based on elevation and difficulty um, from 1 to 10. Some also have seasonal bonuses. So the one I, the, the two that I just activated were both four-point peaks. Um, those Both of those summits have a three-point uh, seasonal bonus. So if you activate them in the winter, they're worth seven points instead of three because the weather up here where I live gets horrendous in the winter so climbing to the top of a mountain in the winter here is awful um, so a lot of those will have those three point bonuses for uh, seasonal activations and things like that when you get to a thousand so they've got uh, certificates at 100 250 500 and when you get to a thousand you get your mountain goat trophy all right um, and it goes on talking about finding your own level like knowing what your capabilities are it talks about the weather we will be talking about the weather later in the series because weather plays a crucial role in some of this stuff they get into walking gear and experience, what to do at the summit, radio kit, which we're going to be talking about today, some of the different modes, antennas, which we'll be talking about in the next uh, the next video, what to expect, chasers, logging and spotting, alerting, frequencies in the reflector, things like that. Um, we've got Soda Watch. That's where our spots are going to be. The database, that's where you're going to do your logging. The summit listings is exactly what it sounds like. The shop is exactly what it sounds like. And mapping is exactly what it sounds like as well. So I just wanted to hop in and kind of show you uh, the, the two different programs and what their websites look like to kind of familiarize you with their layout. I, I would recommend if you haven't ever done any activations, might be a, might behoove you to look through uh, the website and kind of familiarize yourself with the rules, the awards schemes, things like that. Uh, so with that being said, we'll hop out of my computer here. Let's head over to the radios. We'll talk about some radios that I've got. We'll talk about some radios that I don't have and some of the things that you might want to look for in a rig if you're going to go out and do some field activations. So bear with me and I'll be right back. Okay, so I'm back. Um, I apologize if it's kind of loud out, loud out here. It is Friday afternoon and it's supposed to be a lousy weekend and everyone on earth is mowing their lawn at the moment. But this is the only chance I'm going to get to shoot this video for the next week or so. So bear with me. If it gets real noisy, I will uh, kill the video and I'll come back. I'm doing this outside because the lighting inside, to be honest, isn't all that great. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit about field radios, some of the things you might want to consider when we look at a field radio. Um, and we're going to kind of go through my <coughs> outline here. All right. So I'm going to kind of go through some of the different things on this sheet here. And we're going to talk about... Uh, some of the things you need to consider when you go to buy a field radio. Um, the first thing I'm going to tell you, generally speaking, is, and I have this philosophy with a lot of things. So for those of you who don't know, in my professional life, I teach automotive technology. And so I tell my students, when you buy tools, buy the best tools you can afford, buy once, cry once. I kind of have the same philosophy with the radio stuff. Not always, because some of the cheaper stuff gets the job done too, and it will with hand tools also. I tell my kids that too. Not everything you buy has to be snap-on, right? But don't buy junk and try not to buy the same thing multiple times unless, of course, you're weird and you want to like me and have 5 million radios. Uh, so we'll talk. We've covered some of these radios on my channel before. I'm gonna, and I'm going to get to these radios in a minute. We'll talk about strengths and weaknesses and what things you need to consider when you're buying a field radio. But right now, I kind of want to go down through my list of things that we need to consider when we're buying a radio. Okay. So one of the first things we need to look at is power. All right. Um, do you want QRO or QRP, right? Do we want to run 100 watts or do we want to run 5 watts? Or maybe you want to run 1 watt. Um, you know, that's going to kind of be up to you and it's going to, the mode is going to depend a lot on that too, which we'll talk about in a minute, right? So the highest power radios I've got here are the G90 here and this FX4CR. Those are both 20 watt radios. <clears throat> Everything else on the tab table is less than that. Um, 10 watts, 10 watts, 5, well, actually less than 5 watts, 5 watts five watts, five watts, and then we got a couple HTs we'll talk about in a minute. Um, but like I said, consider that first, right? You're going to get a lot more contacts with high power than you are with low power, but then you've got to carry all that crap around, right? I mean, if you want to carry that FTDX10 I just had in my office a minute ago out in the field, you absolutely can. People do, people uh, carry radios like that on the field all the time, but you're probably not going to want to rock way back into the woods with that, right? So when we look at power output, that's something we need to consider is do you want to carry a huge, big, heavy radio? 
And keep in mind, if you're running high power, you're also going to have to bring more power with you, right? Your battery is gonna to have to be much bigger and much heavier. So that's something we really need to consider. The next thing we need to look at is we're talking car portable or man portable. So if you're gonna roll up to a park and, or, you know, or drive to a up, drive up summit, because they exist around here, and walk 10 feet from your car and do an activation, <clears throat> you can absolutely bring a full-size QRO radio. You can bring a hundred big full-size 100 watt rig. You can bring that FTDX 10 or an ICOM IC7300, all sorts of things, right? Grab it out of the trunk, haul it over the picnic table, set up, you're good to go. If you're walking way back in the woods, like I said, you're probably not gonna wanna carry that. How much weight are you willing to carry? Um, the heaviest radio I'm willing to put in a backpack and carry is probably that G90. Even that thing's probably too heavy for me. Most of the time, if I've gotta carry anything in any distance, it's gonna be one of these little tiny QRP rigs. Probably one of these three, maybe one of these, depending on what I'm doing. Because again, I don't wanna carry a big heavy radio, a big, big heavy power supply in. The next thing we need to consider is your budget. <clears throat> um, how much are you willing to spend, right? These radios can be obscenely expensive. Um, some of these can be had pretty cheap. Some of them, we'll talk, I'm gonna talk about all the radios that I have here on the table in a little bit. And we'll talk about um, some of the specs and we'll talk about cost. You don't need to break the bank. You can go buy a used radio, right? You don't need to buy brand new. Go buy something used. I've got multiple used radios on the table right now. Um, you don't need to go out and spend huge money on a really high-end radio, especially if you're not sure it's something you really want to keep doing, right? Go out and buy something used that's cheap. I mean, the cheapest radio I've got on the table here for HF is this True SDX, but it's got its shortcomings. It would get the job done. I talked about that in how to do POTA on the cheap uh, video, but it's got its shortcomings. Uh, you'd probably be better served if you wanted to do Poda and you, or, or soda, and you knew you were going to do it. And you didn't, you had a little bit more money to spend. You'd be better off spending, a, you know, another 100, 150 bucks and buying a decent used radio that would get the job done. This will do it, but it's it's not great. Um, the next thing we need to consider is: Do you also maybe need an HT or a UHF VHF mobile radio? Right. Nothing says that you have to do this completely on HF. You can absolutely make contacts on UHF VHF whatever. Right. You can't use repeaters. But I can absolutely fire up this HT and make contacts, especially if you're doing soda, especially out west. Here in the northeast, it's not as easy. But if you're in in the west on the west coast, where those those mountains are close in close proximity to big population centers, I mean, you can make tons of contacts just on an HT. A good antenna would be a good idea, like a uh, a um, two meter half wave antenna, like a, a MFJ a long ranger or a Smiley half wave two meter, something like that, or a roll up J pole. But you can absolutely do it. And keep in mind, you do, need, you do not need a $400 FT5D to do that, right? This $20 Balfang UV5R will do the exact same job. Is it quite? Is it a nicer radio? No. Will it serve the exact same purpose? Absolutely, right? And this is 20 bucks, this is 400. So that's something to consider too, right? You don't need to spend insane amounts of money. I might spend a little more money and buy a little bit better HT than this, but realistically, this will get the job done, all right? Sorry about the train. Like I said, it gets loud around here. So um, from there, like I said, we got to consider our power supply options. So if you're running higher power, you're going to need a bigger battery, right? If I'm running a QRO radio, I mean, I don't have any 100 watt radios that I take out in the, in the field. But if I run in one of my 20 watt radios at full 20 watts, it's either a six or probably this 12 amp hour lithium iron phosphate, phosphate battery. And this thing's pretty big. It's not super heavy, but I don't really want to throw it in a backpack and carry it around. I have. It kind of sucks. Um, but that's something to consider also, right? If you're going to run a big 100-watt radio, you're going to need a big power supply. It's going to be big. It's going to be heavy. Now, if you're going to roll up and pull this stuff out of your car, put it on a picnic table, and just go, that's not a big deal. But if you're going to hike up a mountain or hike down a, four or five miles into the woods, uh, up and down a trail to get to your activation point in a, in a state or national forest, you probably don't want to carry this giant 12-amp-hour battery around, all right? So that's something to consider also. Now, a lot of these little QRP radios, I mean... I can get away with one of these three amp hour bioeno batteries. This battery will power every every radio on this table for a while. I powered every single radio on this table, well, not the HDs, but everything else off of these um, bioenos. Um, actually, the one radio I can't power off of that is this mountain topper. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, but this will power all these radios. I mean, they'll power these radios all day. This SW3B guy, I could run the thing for eons on that. Um, same thing with that TX500. That TX500 is super, super efficient. So, you know, with, if you're running a QRP radio, especially if you're turning the power down, so like I'll run these at five watts a lot, 
I mean, this thing will go all day long. I could run activation after, I don't charge these every after every activation. I might charge them once in a blue moon. These things go forever, right? You wanna get even smaller and lighter. So like, here's my little talent cell that I run with my mountain topper. Um, you'll see this in videos when I run the mountain topper. I've got other battery packs I can run on that too, but this thing's tiny. You've seen the little tiny um, four AA holder that I run my with my SW3B, which is about two thirds the size of this, right? So that's even smaller. I can run the mountain topper off a nine volt. So I've got a nine volt battery connector that plugs into the power source on this mountain topper. And I can run this mountain topper off a nine volt battery, a little tiny regular old nine volt battery. So again, you know, your power is gonna be dictated by, your power supply is gonna be dictated by how power hungry your radio is. Now there are all sorts of calculators on the internet where you can calculate your power requirements. So make sure that you're, power, you're, you're bringing enough power along with you to actually power the radio, but you don't need to go overboard. Don't carry, you know, a huge, like 30 amp hour battery into the woods. You don't, it's not necessary. I've run, I've already run four or five activations on this talent cell and it's still got four out of five of the little LEDs lit. So, I mean, this thing's still probably three quarters charged and I've run multiple activations on that. I mean, you can go even smaller. So here is, this is one of the packs that you'd run the, the uh, Elecraft off of, the KX2. This is actually not an Elecraft battery. It's the exact same pack though. Um, they're 2,600 milliamp hour, 11 volt um, lithium ion batteries. I actually bought this one on Amazon and I made an adapter that goes from this plug to the, the barrel jack in the KX2. So I can run this in the KX2 or I've got other ones that I hook on here. I've got one with power poles. So I can run this on multiple radios. But again, these are like 30 bucks, right? So that's something to consider. Um, your, your power supply is gonna be dictated by how much power your radio is gonna run, right? And how much, how much power you wanna run is gonna be dictated by what your, your, uh, what your requirements are, right? And we're gonna talk about modes in a minute. Some of your power requirements are gonna kinda be dictated by your mode to some extent. Now that's not to say you can't run QRP single sideband. I've done it plenty of times, um, but it's harder. So that's something to consider. Um, what about, do you have AC power available? So if you're going someplace where you can plug into the wall, you could bring your your AC power from your shack, right? I mean, I could take my power supply out of my out of my from my FTDX10, stick it in the car, bring it with me, and plug it in. Wiring and fuses. Make sure that you're if you're building. I apologize if it gets loud here. He's starting a lawnmower here. He's pulling into the trailer. Hopefully, it doesn't get too loud. But if you're building your own wiring harnesses for these things, make sure that the wiring can handle the current that it's going to draw. Make sure that the fuses are the correct fuses. Make sure that the the current uh, requirement for the fuses is correct. Um, I'm going to pause this right here while he pulls that um, lawnmower in. I'll be right back in just a second. Okay, I'm back. Sorry about that. That would have been loud. It only took 10, 15 seconds, but it would have been deafening. So, um, like I said, consider fuses. Make sure you bring extra fuses with you. You pop a fuse out in the field, that can cause issues. What about charging? Are you, if you're going to be out for extended periods of time, you might either bring backup batteries or a way to charge these, right? So solar, things like that. I mean, you can bring the charger with you, and when you get regular AC voltage, you know, AC power, plug in and charge your batteries. You could bring um, solar panels, right? So you got a lot of different options with that kind of stuff as well. Now let's talk about modes. All right, because modes, when we talk modes, this is going to kind of dictate what kind of radio you buy. Okay. So we've got three basic modes, right? We've got phone. So that could be single sideband. That could be FM. That could be AM. That could be whatever. CW. And then a multitude of digital modes. There's a whole slew of digital modes that we're going to look, well, we're not going to look at, but you could run. All right, now phone is gonna get you the most contacts. Uh, now he's running a uh, leaf blower, fantastic. Um, phone is gonna get you the most contacts, right? There's gonna be the most operators on phone. And not all of these radios are capable of doing phone, right? So like this SW3B, CW only. This mountain topper, CW only. This KX1, CW only, right? So obviously if you wanna run phone, you don't wanna buy one of these little QRP CW only radios because they're very limited in what they can do. This will receive single sideband but it won't transmit single sideband. These guys are CW only, straight up CW, they won't do anything else, okay? This will, like I said, this will receive CW, or receive single sideband, but you can't transmit on it. Um, so like I said, if you're gonna operate phone, make sure you buy a radio that can do phone and make sure that it's got enough power. Keep in mind, phone is gonna be the least efficient mode you can run. It's gonna take the most power to get that signal out, okay? So if you're gonna run phone, keep that in mind. Now I'm not saying you can't run five watt QRP single sideband. You can, I've done it. 
just keep in mind it can be an exercise in frustration right so like this radio 20 watt radio i've done lots of single sideband on this this guy 20 watt radio great for single sideband i've run single sideband on this uh, tx500 and had lots of contacts but it depends on band conditions I've never made any activation single sideband contacts on this. I've done some single single sideband contacts on this, but not in activations. This True SDX, same thing. This will run QRP. This will actually get up to around six watts single sideband. This surprisingly, the internal microphone of this thing is actually quite good. The speaker's lousy, but the microphone's quite good. Um, so again, make sure you buy a radio that will run the modes you want to run. Now, if you're going to run CW, CW is super super efficient, right? Oh, one last thing I want to mention with with phone. Keep in mind. Um, See, uh, phone has the lowest barrier to entry, right? You buy the radio, you pick up the mic, you key it up, and you call CQ. Now, because of that, the bands can be quite crowded. So on a weekend, you might have a hard time finding space on the band. You might not find a clear frequency, right? Because it might be crazy busy. So that's something to consider as well is, you know, if you're going to run single sideband, um, that because it is probably the most popular of the modes you do need to consider the fact that the bands might be quite busy because it does have the lowest barrier to entry so like i said cw that's sort of my my bread and butter um c -day is c cw is super efficient it's probably got the highest barrier to entry too right because it's a, a complete skill set you have to learn you have to learn the cw you've got to learn the abbreviations you've got to learn how a qso goes right it's not there's there's a, a formula to it um and it's something you've got to learn okay there are fewer hunters. So if you're activating on CW, keep in mind, you're gonna have fewer hunters than you do on single sideband. There are, there are probably thousands of people hunting single sideband at any given time. There might only be a few hundred hunters, okay? So that's something else to consider. Um, one of the cool things about uh, CW is you can use the reverse beacon network to spot yourself. So you don't, as long as you've scheduled your activation, and we'll talk about some of that in later videos, as long as you've scheduled your activation, you start calling CQ, these things, will you'll get spotted by the reverse beacon network. With single sideband, you have to self-spot or have someone spot for you. So you've either got to have internet access and go onto the POTA page and spot yourself, or someone else has to spot you, okay? With this, I don't need cell service. And we'll talk, again, we're going to talk about spotting in another episode, and there are multiple ways you can spot yourself. But with these guys, like, if I hop on this mountain topper and I call CQ and I've scheduled my activation, I'm going to get spotted. So that's another really cool thing, okay? Another thing about CW is CW is very very bandwidth efficient right you got very narrow signals so you need little tiny slivers of the band to run cw so you can pack a whole pile of signals in a tiny amount of band space okay so cw is going to be a lot more efficient it's more power efficient um it's more band efficient um, and one thing that you've got to remember too and most people don't do this but you can run cw anywhere in the band that you want you can't run single side band and digital anywhere we want in the band CW, you can run anywhere you want in that band. As long as it's within your privileges, you can run anywhere in the band you want. Okay? So that's something to consider also. Now, digital, right? So when we talk about digital modes, so primarily we're going to talk FT8. Okay? And keep in mind, digital is extremely, extremely efficient. Digital is going to be the most efficient, especially when bands are bad. Okay? When the bands are lousy, uh, single side band is not very good. CW is fairly good. Digital is often quite good. Um, it's also the slowest mode. The QSOs are going to take the longest. So that's something you need to consider too, is if you're doing a digital activation, that QSO rate is going to be down. So it's going to take you a little longer to actually do that activation. Okay. Um, again, you need ancillary stuff. You're going to need a computer or a phone. If you're running, you can run FT8CN on your phone. You can do that as well, but you're going to need a computer of some sort. You're going to need an interface. You're either going to need a sound card, an external sound card, like a DigiRig or a SignalLink, or you got to have a radio that has a sound card built in. So like this FX4CR will do, has a built-in sound card. It'll do USB and Bluetooth digital. My FTDX10 built-in sound card. You plug a USB card or a USB cable in and you're ready to go. Uh, these two radios, this radio, you need an external sound card. I've got a DigiRig for those radios. Um, this guy uses a different DigiRig than these two do. Um, but I do have digital interfaces for all these radios. I've run digital on the TX500 and the G90. I've never run it on the uh, KX2. If I generally, if I'm running digital, I'm doing it at home and I'm using my FTDX10. And if I'm in the field and I know I'm gonna run digital, I'm probably gonna bring this guy or the G90, okay? Um, so that's something you need to consider as well. Also keep, keep in mind, if you don't have one that does Bluetooth, you're gonna have to bring a radio, or you're gonna have to bring all your cables along too, right? So you're gonna need cables that go from your radio to your sound card if, if you need it. You're gonna need that USB to go from your interface to your, your computer. 
Um, so there are other things you've got to bring along when you're doing digital also. Those are things you've got to keep in mind. Uh, you can RBN spot on digital, like FT8. So that's important to know as well. Um, and the last thing, remember, you're going to need software, right? So you've got to download the software and you're going to have to set that software up ahead of time and make sure it works. That's not something you really want to do on the fly. You're going to have to play with the settings, get the radio to work with the interface. Okay, so that's something to consider with digital. Digital can be a little finicky until you get it set up. Once it's set up, it's just fire and forget. But getting the initial setup going is kind of can, or can be kind of difficult depending on the radio and the software and your skill level too. Keep in mind, if you're not real comfortable with computer stuff, uh, digital might be the barrier to entry to digital might be kind of high too because you won't have the skill set necessary to get everything working. So those are our modes. Phone, lowest barrier to entry, least efficient, most hunters. CW, super efficient, highest barrier to entry because you've got a whole lot of knowledge you've got to have. And then digital is the most efficient, um, fairly high barrier to entry and you need other things also, okay? Now, when we talk about radio features, this is gonna be a personal preference kind of thing, okay? So let's start with displays. Simple versus complex. Do you need a waterfall, right? So like this has got a color waterfall on it. This has got a color waterfall on it. This has a monochrome pan adapter on it. This guy has a color band scope on it. Do you need that? Or, well, this actually has a pan adapter on it too. The beta software does. I don't have it loaded on here right now, but do you need that, right? So like the KX2, the mountain topper, the KX1, that SW3B, monochrome screens, very little information. Um, the screen on this KX2 is really, really good. Um, these guys are very simple, especially that KX1. There's not much of anything going on on the screen of that KX1. These guys are super simple. Do you need all that G-Wiz stuff, right? If I'm doing an activation, I'm gonna plop myself on a frequency and sit there. I probably don't need all of the other stuff, right? I probably don't need a waterfall. Now, a waterfall can be nice if the bands are crowded to see where you've got an opening in that band to plop your signal. Or if you're gonna hunt, that can be very helpful to make sure you're actually landing on the right person, right? You can actually see their signal on the waterfall. But do you need it? Absolutely not. If you're, if you're activating, you probably don't. Is it nice to have? Probably. Do you need it? Absolutely not. Um, do you need an internal tuner? All right, so out of all the radios here, only three of them have tuners. The KX2, the KX1, and the G90. These have, these have antenna tuners in them. None of the rest of these radios do. Now, we'll talk about antennas in the next video. I generally run resident antennas in the field, so it doesn't matter. I don't care if they have tuners or not. Is a tuner nice to have? Yeah. If you've got some funky SWR going on, you can hit the tuner and tune it up a little bit, or you break your antenna and you, you decide you want to ran, run a random wire. I can run a random wire on these guys. I can't do that on these without an external tuner, which is something else you might want to consider. Do you want an external tuner? Right, I've got a little ZM2. I don't have it here on the table, but I've got a little ZM2 tuner, ZM2 Z-Match tuner with two little dials on it. You can tune, you can use that to tune these guys up. So, do you need an internal tuner? Absolutely not. Is it nice to have? Probably. Is it a deal breaker? Not for me. Um, and that may be, it may be for you. You may say, I've got to have a tuner. I'm not going to mess with the radio that doesn't have a tuner. Keep in mind that's going to limit your your options, and it's going to increase the cost of the radio. Right? I mean, the cheapest radio on the table here is this True SDX. No tuner. Next cheapest. No tuner, all right? Next cheapest, no tuner. Next cheapest, no tuner. Next cheapest, tuner, unobtainium, right? Next cheapest, no tuner. I lied, this is super cheap too. The most expensive, the most expensive radio on the table, tuner. The hardest to get radio on the table, tuner. The most ubiquitous HF radio you're probably gonna see, tuner. The rest of these guys don't have tuners. Okay, so if you think you need a tuner, buy some of the tuner. If you can get away without it, not a problem, it, it's less space and weight, right? This SW3B is the size of a deck of cards. Doesn't need a tuner, right? This is probably a set pack, size of a pack of cigarettes. Doesn't need a tuner if you run resonant antennas. Um, do you need an internal power supply? Internal power supply is nice to have, it is absolutely not necessary. And not including the HTs, the only two radios on this table that have the ability to take an internal battery are the Elecrafts. This has an internal battery pack, this can take double A's. That's it, none of the rest of these batteries can be powered internally. Again, it's a want versus a need. Do you want an internal battery or do you need an internal battery? I don't need an internal battery. I can absolutely plug an external battery in and run, all right? Do I want one? Sometimes it's nice, right? If I wanna take the bare minimum kit, 
This KX-1 is tiny. It doesn't weigh much anything. I can throw some double A's in that thing and go do an activation. I don't need an external, I don't need an external battery. I don't need an external tuner. I don't need anything. I can take these paddles off of here and this is just this little, this little rectangle and it's tiny, okay? So yeah, sometimes it's nice. Is it necessary? Absolutely not. And I can tell you right now, internal batteries can sometimes be a pain in the butt. Um, so do you need it? No. Is it nice to have? Sometimes, but it's absolutely not necessary. But if you want something that's got an internal battery, that's really gonna limit your your options. Um, you can run a KX2. Uh, you could do like a, a Jaguar 6100, that kind of thing. There's not a lot of, uh, you could do an IC705. There aren't a lot of radios out there that have internal batteries though, so keep that in mind as well, okay? Do you need, like I said, do you need Bluetooth? If you do, you've only got, only got a couple of options or an internal sound card. I mean, you can do an FX4CR or an IC705, unless you're gonna go with a full size rig, in which case that's a different story. Weather resistance, right? So the, none of these radios like water, except the only ones I'll get wet are the FT5 and the TX500. Those guys are ruggedized and weather resistant. I wouldn't call them waterproof but they're weather resistant. I'm not afraid if they get rained on. I'm not afraid if, I, in fact, I have dropped this in the snow. I'm not gonna panic. I drop this KX2 in the snow, I'm gonna panic. I drop this guy in the snow, I'm gonna dust it off and keep on going. So do you need weather resistance? If you need weather resistance, you've got, let's see, about one option and you're looking at it, all right? Um, if you don't need the weather resistance, the sky's the limit. Pretty much any radio will work. If you're someplace where you're gonna be operating in the rain or the snow or that kind of stuff, I can't think of another radio, HF radio, aside from like a military radio, that's gonna fit the bill. You're really looking at a TX500, okay? And then finally, are there other ancillary things you're gonna need with the radios? So do you need a CW key? If you're gonna run CW, you're gonna need a CW key. Key, do you want a straight key? Do you want paddles? Do you want a single paddle? Do you want dual paddles? Um, I've got a single paddle versus dual paddle field key video scheduled to release in a little while, and I go over some of the Oh, no, I don't. Yes, I do. I go over some of the, the benefits and drawbacks to single versus dual paddle on field keys and things like that, okay? Some of these have built-in keys, right? So this has got a key attached to it. It comes off. The push the talk button on this TX500 actually operates as a CW key. So that's something to keep in mind also. If you're going to do digital, like I said, you're going to need the computer. You're, you may need your, your sound card and all your accessory cables. Do you need an external speaker or headphones? Some of these radios don't have internal speakers, okay? TX500, no internal speaker. I've gotta have the speaker mic attached to it or I have to have external speaker or exter an external speaker or, an external, or external headphones. An external powered speaker on this thing is not super easy. Headphones is easy. No internal speaker, gotta have headphones or a speaker. No internal speaker, gotta have external headphones or an external speaker. No internal speaker, right? So I've gotta have headphones or a speaker. The FX4CR, internal speaker, internal speaker, internal speaker, internal speaker. Is it nice to have? Yes. I actually like radios that have internal speakers. That's one of the things that I kind of look for in my radios that I want that sort of are all inclusive shack in a box kind of things. With these little tiny QRP radios, I don't care so much, right? Cause I'm just gonna throw a set of headphones in my pack. Um, but if I'm looking for something that's all inclusive, I really do like to have an internal speaker. It might not matter to you, but again, keep in mind, if you don't have an internal speaker, you're either gonna need headphones or an external powered speaker to plug in. And then finally, manuals. Bring the manual with you. Some of these radios, the manual is just a little piece of paper. Some of these things, I mean, the KX1 and KX2 are literal books. I don't really wanna carry that in the field, so you're probably gonna to wanna to download that on your phone and have it. But have the manual, because you'll forget. You'll see in some of my videos, like when I used the mountain topper, I couldn't remember how to get the uh, CW memory to work. So I, I grabbed the manual and, and did it. I carry the manual with this guy, I carry the manual with this guy, I carry the manual with this guy. The rest of them, the manuals are too big, so I don't carry it with them. Um, but that's something you might want to consider as well. Now, let's talk a little bit about my radios here. And I'm going to talk about some of the available radios that you might want to consider when buying a field activation radio. I'm going to put you guys down on the table here. And we're going to kind of take a look at some of these radios. And we're going to talk about um, some of their specs, just to give you an idea of weight and size and things. All right, so my FTDX10 that was on my desk in, a, in the beginning of the video, that thing is 10 and a half inches by three and a half, uh, 10 and a half inches by three and a half inches by 10.35 inches, and it weighs 13 pounds. I don't know about you, but I don't want to carry a 13 pound radio around in the woods, right? However, it's a 100 watt radio, internal tuner, waterfall with a touch screen, 
It's got one of the best receivers in the world. It'll run 160 meters to six meters. It'll run phone, it'll run digital, it'll run CW. It's a phenomenal radio. Is it a field radio? Not for me, it's not. It might be for you. Like I said, there are people that carry full-size radios out of the field all the time, all right? For me, it's way too big, way too heavy. It's not the kind of thing I'm gonna do, but it is absolutely doable. Sometimes the best radio you have to do an activation with is the radio you already have. If you've already got a radio that will serve the purpose, don't reinvent the wheel and go buy something else. Go out and do an activation with what you've got first. And then later, if you decide, you know what, I really want a better rig for this particular task, you can go buy something, all right? Um, the G90, whoop, I just bumped my camera, I apologize. So this G90, all right, the G90, Oh, one thing about the FX4CR, or not the FX4CR, the, F, the FTDX10 is it is widely available. You can get those anywhere, okay? They're about uh, $1,400. Now, the G90 is, they're about $445, and you can get them anywhere, and you can get them used for like $300 or less. I'm going to be honest with you, for a starter radio, I just tell people go buy a G90 and call it a day. Uh, it, you're you're going to be hard-pressed to find something better, especially for a starter radio, than a G90. Okay, the thing's got... It weighs 4.3 pounds. It's 1.7, uh, one and three quarter inches by about two and three quarter inches by about eight and a quarter inches. It weighs four, a little over four pounds. It's 20 watts. It's got a waterfall. It's got an internal tuner. It's 160 to 10. It'll do phone, CW, and digital. It's kind of the only thing it doesn't have is an internal battery. It's got an internal speaker. All right. Is it the greatest radio ever? No. Is it the greatest starter radio ever? I'm gonna go ahead and say yes. People will argue that one with me, but I don't think you can get a better starter radio, especially for the money. And like I said, you can find these things used all day long for 300 bucks or less, okay? KX2, that is sort of the, the one of the gold standards of field radios, okay? So the G90 is about $1,600 as of today for a shack in the box, which is what this is. There's about a 16 week wait and I, that's optimistic. I'll bet you it takes longer than that to get it. It's about 5.8 inches by 2.8 inches by one and a half inches. It weighs 13 ounces. Now mine weighs a little bit more because it's got the heat sinks and stuff on it. 10 watts, internal tuner, internal battery, phenomenal filtering, phenomenal receiver. 80 meters to 10 meters, this will run phone, CW, and digital, although it's a little clunky on digital. Blue Jay, you're very loud. Saying hi to my viewers. <laughs> Sorry about that, folks. Okay, TX500. It's about $1,150. Uh, it's only available in the United States for ham radio outlet. If you're in Europe or some other part of the world, there are other distributors for them. Um, Availability is hit or miss. Um, it's three and a half inches by eight inches by eight tenths of an inch. Power out, uh, weighs 13 ounces. Power output's 10 watts. No, uh, I'm sorry, I'm lying to you. That's the, I'm looking at this. Um, it weighs 19.4 ounces. Power output's 10 watts. It's actually 11-ish watts. Uh, it's very rugged, it's very weather resistant. That's the most rugged HF radio I own. It's got a pan adapter and it's monochrome, so it's super easy to read in the sun. Some of these screens are very difficult to read in the sun. The monochrome ones are very easy to read in the sun. Um, it's got superb audio, su great, great receiver, great filtering. It runs 160 meters to six meters. It'll run phone, CW, and digital. We've got our FX4CR, all right? This guy is currently unavailable. Um, BG2FX, the guy who builds these, uh, builds them in batches. So if you want one, keep your eye on his website. Be careful that there are phonies out there, okay? So make sure you're getting the real thing. Um, U is very responsive to his to his uh, customers. He does a very good job with the firmware on these things. It was hot garbage when I first got it. It's very good now. You'll see in an, a later activation video how good the CW is, is on this now. Um, it weighs about exactly a pound. It's 4.2 by 2.6 by 1.7. Power output's 20 watts. It's got a color waterfall, Bluetooth digital, 160 meters to six meters, phone, CW, and digital. And out of every radio I have here, that is the best radio for digital. If you're gonna run digital, out of all of these radios, this is the guy I would buy. Again, hard to get right now. They, he sells them in batches, they're 550 bucks. But if you want one, keep your eye on his website. When you see orders open, snag one. It's gonna take a while to get. Mine took a couple months to get. It was worth the wait. Initially, it wasn't. When I first got it, like I said, it was a little sketchy on CW. Digital and single, single sideband were great. Uh, CW was a little sketchy. It's phenomenally good now. You'll see in a later activation video how good it really is now. Um, from there, the KX1. Um, price? <laughs> uh, well, that depends on if you can find one or not. There's one on sale on eBay right now for 405 bucks. It's a two-bander with no internal tuner. This is a four-bander with an internal tuner. Uh, this is probably going to be a $600 radio if you can find one. Um, avail uh, how long is it going to take you to get one? <laughs> well, do you have a time machine? They haven't made these in years. right? So if you want one, it's used market only and good luck. 
Um, it's 5.2 by 3.1 by, uh, I'm sorry, 5.2 by 3 by 3, uh, 1.3. 1 um, it weighs nine ounces, about five watts output. It's a little less actually. Uh, internal tuner, internal batteries. Like I said, I'll take double A's and won't run the full power output on those. This is 80, 40, 30, and 20, and it's CW only. All right. Then we've got our LNR Precision uh, MTR 4B, 370 bucks. Um, they open up ordering on the first of every month. They sell 25 units a month, and that is it. So if you want one, you got to be on the first of the month. Order it. It took mine took about a month to get. All right. This guy is four inches by two and three quarter inches by one. I'm sorry, no, it's five inches by three inches by three quarters of an inch. It weighs 7.9 ounces. This thing is obscenely light. All right. Um, about five watts. It's 80, 40, 30, 20, and it's CW only. All right. Then we've got our Venus Tech SW3B. This guy's 188 bucks, comes from China. It took a few weeks to get. Um, it's four inches by two and three quarter inches by one inch. This thing's tiny. Weighs 6.43 ounces. Right, this thing is very, very light. Um, about five watts, um, 40, 30, 20, CW only. Now, one of the things that's cool about this radio is this is the smallest CW radio I've ever seen that has separate RF and AF gains. It's got an encoder. All right, you'll see that the mountain topper doesn't have any of those. I can't set the RF gain and AF gain, at least not easily. No encoder. Now, one of the cool things about this is it's got direct frequency entry. So those, for if, so if you're a CW operator, you can change frequency by using these up and down arrows, but you can put it in direct frequency entry mode and you key your frequency. So if I wanted to go 14.059 and I'm on 20 meters, I just send da 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 da. Sorry, yeah, da 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 da. Did it did it da 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 did. So you send 059, hit load, boom, sends you directly to 14.059. So you just send the frequency in CW and hit load, and it loads the frequency. It's so cool. It's an awesome, awesome feature of this radio. Um, but like I said, CW only, CW only, CW only. The last radio I've got here, the True SDX, uh, 3.5 inches by 2.3 inches by one inch, weighs five ounces, it's about five watts. It's got a pan adapter, but it's tiny and it's in beta and it's very, very slow. I actually don't have the beta software loaded on it because it is so slow. Uh, this is 80, 60, 40, and 20. This will run phone, CW, and digital. This will do everything, all right, which is crazy. It's not really good as a main rig. It's This is my backup radio. I always carry this as a backup radio on my activations in case my first radio takes a dump. I'm big on having backups, two is one, one is none. We'll talk about some of that stuff in the video on getting ready for your activation. This will get the job done. You can use this as your sole radio for doing activations, but I wouldn't want to. It's doable. I, I, it would not be my first choice. Now, what are some other good options out there, right? Because I don't have every radio you could possibly use, not even close. And this is not an exhaustive list. A Yisu 891. You want a 100-watt radio to fit in a backpack? Awesome choice. 100-watt radios. Um, you can run an ATAS, ATAS antenna with that, one of their screwdrivers. So you want it to hook up to your vehicle and have it tune up easily on those bands no problem keep mine super high q uh jagu 6100 qrp it's a shack in a box internal radio uh it's got internal sound card you name it color waterfall um the receiver can be overloaded pretty easy but it is a good option and they're fairly inexpensive um qcx and a qcm qcx mini the qcm or qxm or whatever the new one is i think it's qxm i got that wrong um they're tiny they're inexpensive but there's a long wait time um, it's a mono band if you buy the QCX. If you buy the QMX, I think that's what it is. Um, they're hard to get right now. There's a long wait time to get a finished one. You can get the, the kits a little easier. Um, the firmware is not quite ready to go on those things yet from what I've seen. They're getting better though. ICOM 705, they're expensive and they can be hard to source, but man, that thing has got every option you can imagine except for an internal tuner. Internal battery, color waterfall, touch screen, uh, it's uh, when I talk, it's full coverage. It's 160 to 70 centimeters, right? It'll do everything. Bluetooth, digital, internal battery, internal sound card. The, th the thing is, like I said, complete shack in a box except for an internal tuner. The only reason I don't have a 705 is um, it doesn't really suit my operating style. I will probably buy one eventually, um, but it's, it wouldn't be my personal first choice for a field radio. It might be yours. That might be exactly the right radio for you, especially if you're going to run digital. They can be tricky to get right now. An ICOM 7300, the sort of the ubiquitous HF rig. Little big, it's a full-size radio, but I mean, totally doable out in the field. There are lots of guys that run, if you're not hiking it out in the woods, a 7300, a 7300 is a great choice. Uh, Pentac TR35 and two, TR45, they're really cool little QRP CW radios. They're expensive and they're hard to get though, 
all right? Um, like I said, UHF and VHF HTs or mobile radios. Again, you gotta pay attention to where you are. Where I am, I'm not getting any contacts on this unless they've been pre-arranged. I'm not getting two meter or 70 centimeter contacts. Um, like I said, if you're at top of a mountain out west, yeah, you probably will. And there are all sorts of used radios. Like I said, there are used radios everywhere. Like I said, use what you already have. If you've already got a radio that fits the bill, use it. You do not need to go out and buy any radio to do this stuff. If you've got a radio that will suit the purpose, take it out in the field and try it. If it doesn't work well for you, then, you know, you can go back and, and evaluate, do I want to buy a field radio? The answer might be yes, or if it worked good for you, you might be like, nah, man, my 7300 for my shack is perfectly good for this. I'm good to go, all right? And I'm sure there are lots and lots and lots of other options that I've missed. It can be dizzying, all right? Any radio will work. Just find something that fits your criteria of size, weight, power, features, availability, and cost. Like I said, some of these radios I have on this table are obscenely expensive. Too expensive. Haha, <laughs> good luck. Expensive. Um, hard to get. Hard to get. Impossible to get. Hard to get. Can be hard to get. Like I said, if you're looking for a starter HF radio to get into this stuff, I would probably buy a G90. If you want something that's a little more all-inclusive, maybe a 6100, a uh, Jaguar 6100. Um, if you can swing it, I mean, an Alicraft KX2 or a KX3, even KX3 is a phenomenal radio. No internal battery, but it's got a better receiver, better filtering. It'll, you, there's a two meter, you can run six meters. It'll do a two, it's, you've got a two meter module for it, right? So you've got a lot of options. I apologize if this ran a little long, but I had a lot of different information I wanted to talk about. Those are all different things you really need to consider when you're looking at buying a field radio, right? You need to look at. We'll go, so we'll reiterate our, our things one more time. Power, size, weight, cost, okay? Power supply, your modes, right? You gotta run CW, phone, digital, all the above. I run all the above. What features do you need in the radio? And then finally, what other accessories do you need to bring? Answer those questions. And then once you have those questions answered, you can hone in on the radio that's right for you. All right, so I apologize if this ran a little long, but again, I had a lot of information I wanted to go over. These videos I'm gonna try to make as informative as possible without being insanely long. If anyone has any questions about any of the radios on the table, any of my experiences with any of these radios, any questions about radios maybe that I don't have, but you, you want to bounce ideas off me, feel free, put them in the comments. I'm more than willing to try to answer them for you. Um, what they have, the last thing I'm going to say before I sign off is if you know anybody that has radios near you, ask them if you could try them. You know, hey, can I give your mountain topper a shot? They might say, yeah, sure, go ahead, take it. Or they might say, you know, next time I do an activation, you can come along and give it a shot, right? Find somebody that's got one and give it a shot. But some of these are, are not super common, right? You're, these are not super common. These are not, in fact, most of the radios on this top table are not super common, except for probably the, uh, the Baofeng and the uh, G90 and maybe the FT5, maybe this guy. The rest of these are a little more niche and they're a little more hard to get. So with that being said, I apologize if that was long-winded, but I had a lot I wanted to say. Hopefully you found it informative. Hopefully it gave you some ideas as to my, what you might want to consider before you go out and do your first activation. Or maybe you've already done an activation with your radio and you're like, man, it didn't work real well. Here's some options or some ideas, right? Some ideas on radios you might want to use. Some of the different criteria you might want to think about when you go to buy a new radio. What's important to you? But at the end of the day, buy a radio that fits your cost, you know, your budget, how big it is, how much power you're going to run, the weight, and what mode you're going to run. Figure those things out and then find the radio that fits that, that intended use. So with that being said, I really appreciate everybody watching. Uh, and until the next one, 7-3.